Welcome to Making Metric Easy, presented by Outlaw Technology. I'm Hans Dietrich. And I'm Brie Oaxaca. And each week, we speak with the companies in the trenches of the seed to sale process. Today on our show, we're lucky to have Britton Westwood, an early adopter of Outlaw Technology while at Qualcan, a vertically integrated cannabis company in Las Vegas. And Britton is now a cannabis consultant with many years of experience. Hi, Britton, and welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. And Britton, you know Dave Eagleson. He's the CEO and founder of Outlaw Technology. He's here with us today, too. Hey, Dave. Hey, how you doing, Hans? Hey, Britton. Hi, Dave. Britton, a little late in the, later in the show, I'd like to talk about what you did at Qualcan and your roles there. But first, because we and our listeners find this so interesting, how did you get started in the industry? What is your origin story? Man, it goes way back, actually, once I thought about it. It really started when I was a teenager. My family owned a greenhouse operation up in Canada, and I worked in it almost every day as a teenager, 15, 16 years old, going out there, watering all the plants. We had about 15, 16 greenhouses total by the end of the time that I spent there. And it was a real learning experience for me. I did a lot of different stuff there, learned fertigation, learned plumbing, all kinds of different things, building, construction. I helped build a bunch of the greenhouses. Mainly we did tree seedlings for a reforestation project and some bedding plants and shrubs stuff too, but it was mainly um, tree seedlings. We grew spruce and pine. So I learned a lot about stuff just growing from that when I was pretty young. As I got older, I started using cannabis for pain management and started growing with some of the legacy growers here in Vegas um, way back in the day and just kind of came up that way. And eventually I worked myself into a position at Qualcan, started on the maintenance crew there, worked my way into the admin office space and kind of became like a logistics manager there for all, all things related to the plant movements and all that. And ordering stuff, procuring equipment. Bryn, you were telling me a time that you ran into a little bit of trouble there in Las Vegas when you were working in the legacy market. Would you mind uh, sharing that with us and our listeners? Yeah. I was uh, living in a grow house and it ended up getting raided. I did everything I was supposed to do and ended up getting everything taken care of to where nothing was on my record. And I was able to continue a legal route in the industry. So I was lucky there. Some people I knew weren't so lucky. We all know people who weren't so lucky. And when you did go into the legal market, what were some of the headaches that you came across, especially with all the tracking that you had to do? Well, once I got into the office part of the company, I we were doing everything by hand. Well, not we, I said we as a company. Everything was written down. Every plant tag was written on the last five digits or whatever. And then they were all moved in manually. Someone went into metric and typed in the number and manually moved it over. They were not organized at all when I when I first started there. It was about a year of me transposing numbers for to submit harvest. And some of our rooms, we had 1,800 plants in. And that would take me two, three days just to get the harvest submitted. So, Britton, after doing all those processes by hand for so long, what led you to Outlaw? I found out that some people in the company had been to MJ BizCon the year before and actually purchased a, a scale and an automation system, but never used it. They never implemented it. And so I took it upon myself to just implement it. And it saved us a lot of time. Um it was with a different company. It was kind of cumbersome, to be honest. It was, but that was early adoption. I could see it saved us a lot of time, even as cumbersome as it was. Um, and so it was definitely the way to go, which into automation. Yeah, and it was funny, Britton, if I remember correctly, because uh, you and I talked way, way back when you first got going is, I think your frustration with that vendor is you had a lot of different ideas that they weren't able to really bring to light, right? They couldn't implement or so forth. So I think, you know, you might want to hit on that because I do recall one of the biggest things that I was excited about working with you, to be honest with you, was your insight. You knew what you wanted. You just needed someone to help build it, which is really how Outlaw focuses 
on our systems because we realize we don't know what you need and we need you to tell us. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, switching to Outlaw was one of the best things we did, mainly just because of that. You guys took my suggestions and implemented them within a matter of weeks, where with the other company, it was like a year before an update came out. And you came to us and said, hey, could you make the harvest system do this? Or what if you did this with the handle? Or I'd like to see this on the console. And we've got emails galore between you and our CTO, Justin Peterson, just helping us give you what you needed, which in turn translated to making it easier for the rest of the industry. Because most places, despite some small differences in their processes, all do things the same way. And I personally want to thank you for that, Britain, because it was it, it was a big help to us. And you know, as you guys grew, you kept coming back to us with more ideas. And Bree, I know you've been really involved in helping them get set up uh, at Britain's old company on the dispensary side, right? Correct. Yeah. Our automation tools are now available for our dispensary customers uh, like Quakin to help automate the counts of those finished goods. Like we were able to automate, you know, harvest weights, weight capture and plant audits on the cultivation side. Yeah, it was a huge help. Um, both on the dispensary side and the cultivation side. I know the our inventory people at the dispensaries really, really like the system. I know that they had suggestions too that have been implemented since they suggested them. So you guys are on the money as far as that uh, part of this situation goes. Yeah, and it's greatly appreciated. Like I said, I think we've learned from our customers. Our customers are our best way of designing our products. We you know, I always say the same kind of cliche, which is I don't own cultivation, me, our company. We don't own cultivation processing or dispensaries. We need you guys to tell us. I'm curious, you've been doing it a long time now. What's your thoughts on the metric? We know we call this making metric easy. I mean, I know metric, we've had several uh, people do these podcasts and it seems like a lot of people have really gotten comfortable with metric and understand it better. What's your thoughts? I'm a person that just kind of learns as I go and it was pretty easy for me to pick metric up, honestly. For the most part, there were a few things that I got snagged on, but it's not too hard. I would say Outlaw makes the process way easier, just over across the board. There's a few things that I still had to do manually in Metric, but nothing crazy. I mean, it was minor stuff compared to what I used to have to do. Where do you see the market going in Las Vegas or in Nevada in general? I know you've been involved there for a long time. We've seen some newer grows come in, um, some really large grows. It seems like the market's still going strong. What, what's your experience been, especially since you've been involved in all aspects from cultivation, processing down to dispensary? I would think that we might end up with a few less dispensaries. There's going to be some, uh, some competition that drives some other businesses out of business. I know just down the street from where I live, there's three dispensaries within like two miles of me. Uh, and all on the same street, one just uh, less than a quarter mile, I would say, from one just down the street from it. So I would say that's something that's going to happen. The demand seems to be there. I don't think that the, the demand is going anywhere, especially with the tourist market here. So they, aside from a few dispensaries maybe closing their doors, uh, I think it's going to keep continue growing. Have the prices held pretty pretty strong? I think they're kind of coming down a little bit. I don't shop the retail that much, so it's hard for me to say. I get go to a place where I get really good industry discount, discounts when I'm shopping, so it's hard to say for me because I the discounts. I, I, I noticed that some places that prices have come down, though, recently. Yeah, we've seen that across the country, and I think one of the things that we're also seeing is, you know, places like California, Nevada, Oregon, um, and others, Michigan, actually, where price points are starting to be driven down and people are really focused on, you know, how do they stay solvent? And it's said, you know, you've got to get efficient. I think you hit on it early, Britain, that, you know, having tools, having systems, you know, you need to keep your headcount in check, but you also have to be able to do things as efficiently as possible. I'm curious if you have just even a general sense of, you know, when you were doing the manual, you know, hand uh, <laughs> hand effort that you did and then went over to a system like ours, you know, what kind of savings did that give you? I mean, just roughly. 
You're talking labor wise, right? Labor or even time. Like what we've seen, you know, a lot of folks is, hey, I can do it with one person versus two. And instead of it taking eight hours, we did it in six, those kind of things. Yeah. So not having to write anything down, obviously is going to save you time. Before we adopted automation, we would have two people at the scales, one reading off and writing and the other one weighing and, or I'm sorry, one reading and, and weighing while the other one's writing um, the weights and the numbers down. So once we adopted automation, it uh, narrowed that down to one person and it just basically streamlined the whole process on that end. On my end, if something that took me three days, I could do it in 30 minutes. Wow. So it was- What was that? Like the audits or what are you talking about there? No, just the, the pushing of the harvest, the pushing of the actual weights. Ah, into metric. To metric, yes. It would take me three days to transpose those numbers before on the big room that we had that was 1,800 plus clients. And then it would take me, you know, well, three days to transpose the numbers and um, push everything manually to metric. And then once we adopted, it was like 30 minutes. I just press a button and there might be a plant or two that got missed, but I would, I would develop my own like internal system to figure out if they were, if they were actually in the um, dry run being, uh, then they just got skipped somehow. And then I could just go in and manually um, put in a couple of weights for those two plants or whatever that was missed. And, but yeah, the savings for my time alone was drastic. Britton, I know that you and your wife, Stacy, were heavily involved at Qualcan. How was that working together? And what, what, what was Stacy's role while she was there? Um, Stacy was her head of compliance. She ran everything um, in the office there as far as compliance goes uh, for, for both retail and, and the cultivation side. It was nice. Actually, her and I, we were a great team. We worked together really well. It never really caused tension between us, which a lot of people I hear it, it can. So it's, it's it tough. a lot of divorces because of that. Yeah, I've heard that, heard that. But we make a great team. I mean, we we would get the kids ready for school and head into work together, and then come home together. And it was it was a nice thing to be able to do. Yeah, it's funny, Britton, um, that, that we see a lot more folks that have relatives, friends, family wives in this industry and it's it's kind of nice to see hey i had a question though and i think a lot of people you know listen to this podcast those in the industry understand it but i i find it interesting your history of being in cultivation like you said seedlings and 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 your experience in canada i think people think that this is easy it isn't easy is it Britain? i mean honestly i think some folks you know hey they have this grand vision of i'm gonna join a cannabis company and man i can you know it's gonna be great Maybe you give a sense of like what it's like to actually deal in a greenhouse or deal in a cultivation. I, I think some people just don't understand how challenging it truly is. Uh, I mean, there's so many aspects that come into play when you're growing something like cannabis. Even, I mean, any plant really, but cannabis specifically, trying to get the most THC, the best terpenes out of it. You really have to have your, your environment completely dialed in or you're not going to do well. I can't tell you how many times I've come across people when I'm out and about and I'm wearing like a Qualcan shirt and like a 7-Eleven clerk or something. And they're like, oh, I'd love to work in the industry. And I, I try and tell them it's not glamorous. It's still hard work. There's a lot of things you have that go into making the plant grow and produce and yield good. But most people don't have a clue all the steps that it takes to grow a plant get it dried, cured, tested, packaged, shipped out. There's so many, so many steps in the process. And then to track all of that and report it to the state for compliance purposes adds a whole nother layer that wasn't there before it all became legal. I mean, the good news is you don't get arrested for doing this anymore as long as you're doing it with a license, but it's That's definitely true. not a glamorous job. We do have a lot of fun and Going back to you and Stacy working together and what Dave said, I think maybe a lot of the, one of the reasons so many people can get along in this industry because most people consume the product as well and it, it makes everybody a lot more mellow. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. A lot of people in my office didn't consume. It was a bit different there. My wife doesn't consume anymore, but she, she used to do some edibles just to help her sleep. 
the number of people is, like I said, I, the industry with the squeeze, and I say the squeeze, the pricing squeeze, you know, we're seeing it. We're seeing people used to have 200 people in a cultivation, cutting it down to 100. Well, those 100 have to do double the work unless someone gives them tools. So I'm curious, how's, how's Qualcan when you were there, obviously? I mean, how were they able to stay ahead of it? I mean, I assume you guys ran really lean and mean. Yeah, I mean, our growth team, I think there was like maybe 10 people on the whole wow. entire team with two managers. Our trimming team maybe had a dozen people before I left. Same thing with our processing kitchen team. They might have ramped stuff up a little bit more since I haven't been there, but especially after COVID, we definitely leaned down and trimmed all the fat down that we could. Now, Brayton, you were there at Qualcan throughout the pandemic. What was your experience like? Oh, that was crazy. First week of the shutdown, Stacy and I were the only ones that had needed cards to be able to do deliveries. And so we were running around like mad people that first week so we could get more people with the right credentials to be able to do it themselves. It was just me and Stacy, and it was not. But since then, I mean, everything just kind of, it never really thought for us because we were considered uh, essential. Right. It never really quit, quit for us. We just, it was go, go, go the entire time. We actually sent our kids down to her parents' house for like six weeks right in the beginning there. Wow. We, yeah, I think that's part of the reason why we were able to also do well during the pandemic is because so many rows, all of them were basically considered essential and essential employees working there, but they didn't have enough people. And we were able to provide them with tools to help them get a lot more done with less. Um, oh yeah. I can't imagine us trying to get through it without the outlaw uh, systems to be able to do all that stuff. If we were still doing stuff by hand, oh my gosh, I can't imagine what would have happened. Well, the industry, I think the industry in itself changed quite dramatically, right? It used to be heavy deli style for a long time, and then that had to go away because people can't be touching products, right? Then you had to prepackage things. And I think it really drove a lot of states to open up their minds or their, their willingness to have curbside delivery, have at-home delivery. I think without the pandemic, not to saying it was a blessing, it was not, but I'm just saying it opened up some things that may have taken a lot longer. Um, in certain states, is my opinion. What do you think? Yeah, I think you're 100% right there. I mean, it definitely opened up avenues, like you said, curbside for us. Home delivery was a thing right away for us. That was the only way people could get anything until we caught curbside. The so delivery was crazy for that first week or two. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Dave, you, I remember years ago, you'd been up to Canada and we're looking at the industry there and you were just shocked by how many people they had working in all these grows uh, without having any kind of automation. And I, you know, I know that they were hurt very much by the pandemic up there because they don't have tools like metric or outlaw. Yeah. It was one of those things where you, you kind of go into a facility and again, large facilities, the one I went into was about a five acre facility. So we're talking quite a bit, but you know, two, 300 people that's a lot of people. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and it's a lot of headcount, a lot of money. So I took took that to heart. And, you know, going into, as Britton said, would you say you had 10 people in cultivation, 12 in trimming? That's that's lean and mean. How big is your canopy, Britton, or how big was is Qualcan's canopy? The building itself is 25,000 square feet, but we also have production in that, in that space as well. Can, the flowering canopy was a little over 9,000 square feet. Okay. Yeah, because, I mean, that's... Look, I think, again, not to harp on it, but I guess I will, is the fact that the reality of in today's market, cannabis specifically, is he who keeps themselves, you know, organized, keeps uh, the efficiencies in place are, are going to succeed because, you know, you can't afford to carry, you know, extra bodies, extra people like you could early on, right? In the state I live in, in Maryland, pricing remains fairly high. Some of the staffing, in my mind, seems a little bit higher than maybe a state like Nevada, where you've had to really buckle down. So, yeah, it's been interesting to see how each state has reacted differently. And it's not just that. It's also just being compliant, right? Like, yep, you've got to be compliant or you're not going to be able to stay in business. Here, the CCB is really strict. We're one of the most uh, regulated states in the country. 
probably the most regulated state in the country. So it's tough. You got to make sure you're compliant. And honestly, outlaw, they not only did they save time, but they also eliminated almost all the errors that, that were happening as people were writing, transposing numbers, all of that. So the errors, I, I didn't even touch on that. We must have had, when we would use a big room, it was, gosh, 100 errors maybe out of 1,800 plants that I would have to try and figure out what numbers were transposed where and all that. And so it was a big, big job to try and figure all that out. And automation completely eliminated that, those errors. The, the errors were so minimal that it was nothing. And you need that if you want to stay compliant. And with a facility like Qualcan, where they have at a, any given time, 5,000 plants just in flowering, you got to be compliant. So with that compliance aspect in mind, and you know, you touched on how strict Nevada is, where do you see the industry developing in the next couple of years in Nevada? I'd like to see it go federal. I'm sure we all would. I don't see Nevada getting any less strict uh, over time. If nothing, if anything, they've gotten a little bit more strict, and they've added things that they require. In the you know, since since I've been in the industry, which is oh, almost six years now, in the legal side of the industry, I should say, I would say that they're probably going to get more strict here. It just seems to be the way that the ball is rolling at this point. What is your biggest piece of advice you can give to current licensees, operators, or people that are going for their license to either open cultivation or processing or dispensary, what's the best thing you can tell them that they should look out for? Is it compliance or if you were to be called in as a consultant, what would you, what's a good thousand dollar piece or a million dollar piece of advice? I mean, I know that in order to be compliant, you've got to have the systems to do so. So adopting some kind of automated system, if you have anything more than five to 500 to a thousand plants in a cultivation, then you really need some kind of automation. It'll save you time and save you money. It'll save you on mistakes. It'll keep you in compliance. One thing about the CCB here is they actually adopted the same scanner that you guys use to do their audits. So if you have the same system as Outlaw, does or as CCB does to be able to do those audits before they even come in, then you're golden. Yeah. So Britton, one other question, you mentioned the federal legalization is kind of when Bree asked about growth, how do you see that working? I, from my vantage point here at Outlaw, just looking at the market is I still wonder how that might be both good and bad. And what I mean by this is, you know, will federalization open even borders? Will Canada product, Canadian product, will Mexican product, will, you know, California be shipping to, to Massachusetts? That's the area that I still don't have. I don't know what's going to happen. Any thoughts on your end? I thought about that a little bit. I don't know where it's going to go. Nobody really does. Right. Kinda, you kind of hope for the best, but right now it's, I don't know. Main thing I think is we need to get safe banking. Yes. Something. Something yes. to that. That's the worst part about the industry right now. The companies are just strangled as far as that stuff goes. Yeah. And I think like the other thing that we're seeing is right is the schedule change, right? Take it from a class one down to a class three. I think things like uh, the getting people out of jail, you know, the expungements is critical. I think there's too many people, unfortunately, that have gotten caught in the system. And I say caught in the system. That, that's a challenge. Yeah, I'm not sure we're quite ready. I I want federal legalization as soon as possible, but we need to be ready for it. And as Dave kind of alluded to, we could just see markets flooded other areas where it's produced much more cheaply. And then, you know, we'll see a lot of local companies having to go out of business, which we don't want to happen either. So the regulations have to be in place and they need to be solid and well thought out. But hopefully we'll get there soon written if people want to reach out to you uh pick your brain bring you on as a consultant or for whatever reason regarding the cannabis industry what's the best way for them to contact you uh they can contact me by email my email is bdubcannabis at gmail.com it's bdubcannabis at gmail.com 
Excellent. And Bree, would you like to do the honors of asking the question we ask every guest who comes on here? I certainly would. And our question for you, Britton, is we at Outlaw and our listeners want to know, who is your favorite outlaw? I'm your Huckleberry. That would be Dark Holiday. You are the second person who went for Doc Holiday. Is that right, or, or am I counting wrong, guys? I, th- I think that's about right. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. I think that movie Tombstone made him famous. I mean, he was already somewhat He was already famous, but yeah, that, that did not hurt, that's for sure. Then I'm down on infamy. Yeah, well, thank you, Britton, for being on our show. It was great chatting with you as always. Pleasure. Pleasure being here. And thanks, everyone, for listening. If you have any questions you'd like us to ask on our show about compliance, metric, automation, or anything about the cannabis industry, just email them to us at info at outlawtechnology.net. You can download past episodes of our program by going to outlawtechnology.net, cannabisradio.com, or the Cannabis Radio app for iTunes and Google Play, as well as subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Pandora, and Spotify. Thanks for listening and be well.